When I was in high school, I got my first whistle. And then I got another whistle, and I said, well, when can we blow these things outside? And wait a minute, New Year's Eve, everybody makes a lot of noise. The number of whistles gradually increased. So the neighborhood began realizing, hey, there's this great thing on the Pratt campus on New Year's Eve. The next to the last time we blew it, there were over a thousand people on the campus. A couple of years ago, Pratt said there will be no more steam whistles. And the neighborhood misses it because it was a local Brooklyn thing. We used to have a standing joke that the next day we could tell the state of the economy by whether the empty champagne bottles were domestic or imported. I'm Pratt's oldest employee, both in number of years and in age. They want to get rid of me. I am living in one of the staff houses which have been converted to dormitories. I'm the last resident in one of these houses. They would like me to get out. They terminated me as chief engineer on the flimsy excuse that one of my engineers was allergic to cats and I didn't keep the cats out of the power plant. That's the excuse after 58 years of service. I'm 82. I'm still, thank God, in good shape. Perhaps they did me a favor by taking me out of the power plant because I don't know if I would have ever left on my own. I was in a happy rut. So here we are. A couple of years ago, there was a big flap when they were trying to get the last families out of these houses. The New York Times was going to do a story, Institute throws out 50-year employee type thing, which panicked Pratt. And they came to me and said, I could live in the house as long as I was employed by Pratt which I suspect is another reason for them pushing me out of the power plant. I think they were hoping I would get pissed and quit, which I almost did. This is the original architect's rendering for these houses. I'm in this one right now. Come on, Lily, come to the end. That's my girl. I'm still living in the house. I'm the last survivor of the 27 families because, again, I am still employed by Pratt. I love the neighborhood. If I had a choice, I would never leave this neighborhood. I can't afford it. I don't know who can afford this, this area today. I was tempted to stay, actually, until I had been here for 60 years, but I think it's time I got out and gave myself a few years to do what I want to do. I have been very lucky. I met my wife on a passenger ship on the Great Lakes, and the following year I proposed to her on the same ship, making a, a cruise on the Great Lakes. And she was a nut about steam machinery like I was. We, we were a very happy couple. She died seven years ago, and I wish she was around. She was also a cat lover. We had a very wonderful life together. Phyllis was very involved with cat shows. A number of our cats won some very high awards. She found this shirt in Abraham and Strauss, and whenever we were at the cat shows, this was the shirt that I wore. These are my companions at night, in cold weather especially. This is Tabby and this is uh, Tabby too. I'm a collector. I have collected mechanical artifacts for 50 years. I have collected hundreds of books that the library threw out. A lot of them were related to engineering and I was coming home with hand trucks full of books. The walls are full of small artifacts, nameplates, uh, small pieces. 
Uh, my cellar is full of artifacts too. That's me in the 1939 World's Fair. It was steam power that basically created the Industrial Revolution or, or gave the Industrial Revolution its muscle. The reciprocating steam engine is a very visual machine. There are parts moving. It is also, in a sense, a human machine. A human being interacts with it. And this is probably why I was so interested in it. I've got thousands of feet of 16 millimeter all sitting upstairs waiting to be recopied plus uh, reel-to-reel audio at the same time that I was shooting uh, the movies. Hundreds of reel-to-reel -reel tapes sitting in this cabinet. They're all waiting to be put on digital someday. Project number 487, you know. One of our neighbors once said that our architectural style was musatic, half museum, half attic. Another friend of mine said that too much is not enough. And I think I've had that as my philosophy. Well, that was on the stair going up to the last station or the station at the end of the line. I went down with somebody with the Pratt truck at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And we got out while people were running all around downtown. And we simply unbolted it and put it in the Pratt truck. I guess if you do something obvious enough, people will assume you're doing it legally. I was on the Robert Fulton for a year and a half and three years on the Peter Stuyvesant. The Robert Fulton was a side-wheeler, built in 1909. Oh, I, I loved that. I was in my glory as a, a kid just out of high school. I was an oiler when I, when I started on the Dayline, for example. You had to physically oil all these various moving parts in this machine. You had to feel them to feel the temperature. So you were in constant contact with this piece of machinery. Those of us who worked on it developed a, perhaps an affection for it. There's the heartbreak of not being able to do what I did here for almost 60 years. <laughs> 